Hillstone is the world's first national park, and everybody in America is very proud of that. But there's been a, a struggle to figure out what a national park should be like. And probably one of our founding philosophies is it should be natural. It should be a natural system that functions the way um, the earth did before humans altered it. And so it was written into our policy that we're going to restore and protect natural systems. And the early managers of Yellowstone didn't really know what natural looked like. So we've been struggling towards natural our entire history. And that definition has evolved. And that definition, the modern one, now includes you need to have natural predators. And so we tried to eradicate them. Wolves, cougars, coyotes, bobcat, lynx. We did that in the early part of the 20th century because we thought that was the ideal. We didn't have a complex mindset about policy in terms of natural. And so we restored wolves because the Park Service policy changed towards uh, what is a natural system that includes large carnivores like wolves. We also had the Endangered Species Act come about as law in 1973 that says we cannot wipe some species off the face of the planet. And wolves are very much under that umbrella too. So the best answer as to why wolves were restored to Yellowstone is it makes it a natural system. It was the law, but finally people wanted it. The public's view of nature has changed and evolved. So creatures that were previously considered bad uh, scapegoats have now had an uh, image alteration and a lot of the public demanded that we bring some of these animals back. Well, most ecosystems are best when they're balanced. And I think it's safe to say that Yellowstone without wolves and other carnivores, now keep in mind cougars were also eliminated and they came back on their own and bear numbers declined and that affected the balance of the ecosystem. And so ecologists refer to this as biodiversity, but emphasize the word diverse. Having a lot of different kinds of things at moderate numbers is better than having a lot of any one thing. And prior to wolf recovery, we had a lot of elk, we had a lot of coyotes, and we had very little things like willow and aspen and songbirds and beavers. And so uh, the entry of wolves and other carnivores, because bears have increased and cougars have come back too. So now we're a carnivore rich system and we've restored that top layer of the system. So really the simplest way to look at it is all the parts of the system now are in place and they're interacting differently and I hesitate to use a value judgment laden word, but it, it's healthier this way than we had certain parts of the system before that were absent. So all those things functioning together has made nature look like it used to before we started managing it. And those management intentions were, were good. We just didn't know enough about it. And so we've had this makeover in Yellowstone now. We've brought carnivores back, wolves being the most high profile, and it's changed the way Yellowstone looks. Elk are perhaps the most controversial and talked about aspect of wolf recovery. And that's odd because elk are a species unto themselves, but many people equate Yellowstone with elk. That's arguably our most famous species. They've been debated and studied since the late 1800s. Um, elk are iconic in the West as a huntable species. And so elk are very important and wolves eat elk. So do cougars, so do bears, uh, so do coyotes. A lot of things eat elk, people eat elk. And so the system in many ways hinges on elk. So what wolves and other carnivores do to elk is very important. And very simply, prior to wolf recovery, predation pressure by natural carnivores was very low. No wolves, no cougars, few bears. Bears were here, but their numbers were lower. And that caused the elk population to grow to very large numbers. In fact, a lot of, yellow, a lot of ecologists and scientists criticized Yellowstone for having too many elk. The effect of elk was so dominant on the ecosystem that they suppressed other things. 
uh, to the point where managers outside the park were hunting elk at high rates to try and depress this burgeoning elk herd. With our wolf recovery in the mid-90s, with natural cougar recolonization, with growth in the bear population after decades at low numbers, predation pressure has increased, accompanied by the management um, practices outside the park where people were hunting elk. All of these things together have caused the elk population to decline. And the Park Service considers that a success story. Now that's hard to describe to a lot of people, especially some people who, who can't understand how less is more. We live in a culture where more is always better, but fewer elk brings about that ecosystem balance, that biodiversity that the Park Service seeks as natural. And that's a very important goal for the Park Service. And so having these large carnivores, and Yellowstone may be the place in the world that's got uh, in North America, excuse me, that's got the, the best mix of diversity and density of large carnivores, that will affect the elk population to lower. But we're arguing as a park service that that's more natural or healthier, which is defined as better for the system. And this is a very hard thing to convey because a lot of people liked a lot more elk. It's better hunting. And so this is a complex relationship. But wolves have contributed, not solely, to a decline in elk. Perhaps the most commonly asked question about wolf recovery is that, did we reintroduce the wrong wolf? And this is a long answer, so I'll try and make it as short as possible. Our naming of nature is an artificial system uh, developed by Carl Linnaeus, a Swedish monk in the 1700s. And I don't want to criticize uh, Linnaeus, but, and he did a great job. But essentially, it's an artificial system putting names in parts of nature that might not be actually different things. But there are different things in nature. You have plants and animals, and they're different, and we can call them that, and it works. And his system really works very well until you get down to the very finest levels of, of naming, of distinction. Uh, that's the subspecies level. You have species and then below species you have subspecies. And wolves are the worst example of the subspecies concept. The leading wolf biologist in the world does not believe that subspecies even apply to wolves. And why is that? You get different subspecies, and originally there were 24 different subspecies of wolves. Now there are five. It's constantly being reduced. And of course, this prominent wolf biologist thinks there should be none. But how do you get different kinds of things in nature? Different populations become isolated so they no longer interbreed. When they don't interbreed anymore, the genetics become different. When the genetics become different enough, they become different things. First subspecies, and then species. Wolves always get around, and it's very hard to isolate two populations of wolves. Very hard. Nothing stops a wolf. Not a mountain range, not a river, sometimes not even oceans. The wolves here immigrated to Asia and back. They're very good at getting around, so you don't get much isolation. The best genetics show that wolves in Mexico to wolves in the Arctic are on a continuum of change from south to north. So there's no place we can go in and say, this group of wolves is different from that group. That's a genetic analysis. And the Mexican wolf can interbreed with the Arctic wolf very capably. So did we reintroduce the wrong thing? No. Were the wolves that we put here slightly different from the wolves that existed here 100 years ago? Probably. Nature's always changing. We looked at the weights of the handful of wolves, um, 31 from Canada, which is a very small number, and they were slightly larger than the wolves that existed here uh, 100 years previously, six to eight percent larger. That is well within the natural variation of wolf size across the, the continent. So despite this frequently asked question that these Canadian wolves are unnaturally large and they're therefore at a very big advantage to killing these elk because these elk aren't used to such a large predator, of all the arguments not to have wolves, and there are some good ones, they're tougher to live with, that's an absolutely good argument, 
The idea that we put something in here that's exotic or different is perhaps one of the weakest. Wolves do not kill for sport. That is a fact. Why? The average wolf weight, if we threw all the wolves together, males, females, sub-adults, adults, pups, is about 100 pounds. Uh, the average cow elk is 500 pounds. The average bull elk is 750. They risk injury or death. When you attack something five to seven times as large as you, that ain't a fair fight. So they risk tremendous injury or death trying to take something on bigger than them. So they prey on things in a risk-averse fashion. They only kill what they need to exist, and we've got great data on this. Will they kill more than they can eat? If the risk equation balances out in their favor, they will. What does that mean? Late winter, belly deep snow, elk are weak, they'll kill more than they can immediately eat, but underline the word immediately. We had a situation in March 1996 where one pack of wolves killed five elk in one day. And they cycled back and ate everything on those five elk in over a two week period. Now they were competing with ravens and coyotes and magpies and eagles because they were trying to consume it too. Because as everybody knows, the bounty of nature is shared and competed for. So they went back and they tried to eat it all. But that is common predatory behavior. When you can get an edge, when you can get more food, humans do this too. When oil is cheap, we burn more oil. When wolves can kill more elk, they kill more elk. Because why? That equals more pups. But they only do it when they can. So on average, wolves do not kill healthy elk. It's too hard. If all you can eat are healthy elk, the wolf population goes down. Wolves make their living on vulnerable elk. And so their population waxes and wanes based on vulnerabilities. And hard winter is a vulnerability. But so are things like age and health status and condition, uh, bone marrow, all these different things affect elk vulnerability. And that's what's important to wolves. And that's what they're shooting to take advantage for. Remember, there's no creature in nature that doesn't look for advantages. So no, they do not kill for fun, but yes, they will kill for more what they can immediately eat, but it, if left alone by humans, and this is very important, I get sent emails all the time showing an elk killed by wolves and not eaten, but there's tire tracks, there's human tracks, there's horse tracks. The wolves were bumped off the kill. People found the kill to take a picture of it. Left alone, as we've demonstrated here in Yellowstone, and we've seen it more, killing a couple elk sometimes is fairly common. If they're not disturbed, they'll eat everything. They won't do it immediately because they have a capacity on their stomach. So very, very important point. Killing for fun or bloodthirsty reasons is not true. People should not be afraid of wolves. Uh, there are three primary reasons that people are against having wolves on a, on a shared human landscape. One is they compete with us for wild prey. That's valid, that's true. Two, they occasionally kill livestock. It's rare, but it does happen, and then that's valid too. The third reason is there's a human safety threat, and that is largely overblown. During the entire 20th century in North America, there were about, and I'll be off by one or two, 20 attacks on humans. Uh, none of them were fatal. All of them dealt with habituated animals, usually fed food. And we're very concerned about that in the park. When you feed an animal food, it loses its natural fear of people and it becomes become dangerous. But very different for wolves compared to bears or cougars. They never attack a person on their first encounter with a human. So the first time a bear encounters a person, a sow with a cub, or a cougar encounters a person, they might attack. Uh, and bear fatalities and cougar fatalities are much greater than wolves. Wolves always have to overcome their natural fear. I don't know where it comes from, but they have a natural fear of humans. They've got to overcome that. That's usually through habituation. Typically food conditioning, but not always. Of those 20 attacks that were recorded, um, some were habituation just through exposure, from being around people in a non-threatening way. So wolves have to overcome this natural fear, and then they may attack. Six of those attacks were bites from Alaskan pipeline workers 
feeding them part of their lunch. So six of those 20 year attacks were from that. Since that paper was published, there have been two fatalities. And both of those wolves probably were food conditioned. Uh, some were dump wolves, uh, and others lived around a logging camp. Uh, and so those animals, those are examples of wolf fatalities. So it can happen, but it's extremely rare and less likely for other carnivores. Uh, a big question that's often asked about wolf recovery uh, was, you said the wolves are just going to stay in the park, and I'm fine with wolves in the park. I just don't like them out, because when you leave the park, it's, a, it's a very much a human-dominated landscape. That's another misconception of wolf recovery. The plan written to restore wolves to this region never said the wolves would stay in the park. And it, it's different outside the park, because wolves are managed by the states, and so they have different policies and objectives than the park does. Uh, the park generally stated management philosophy is preservation, which means no use. That's not a, a pure uh, definition because there are, we do manage other species. Uh, the state's um, objectives are largely conservation. That means wise use. Both of those objectives are, are fine and they're determined by people and neither one is better than the other. They're just different. And so naturally they clash a little bit because there's no wolf hunting inside Yellowstone uh, and there is wolf hunting outside of it. Wolves have to live with people outside of Yellowstone. And that does create conflict. It is true to say that life is easier without wolves than with them for the reasons I stated previously. They, they can uh, compete with us for elk and deer and they do occasionally kill uh, dogs and other and, and livestock and so they need to be managed outside the park and that's okay that's part of it and there's some data although other researchers are questioning this that if species are hunted or if species that cause a problem can be immediately dealt with um, social tolerance increases so inside Yellowstone we don't have to deal with those issues we don't have to deal with issues of uh, predation on, uh, on pets or livestock or taking elk inappropriately because I wanted to get that elk. So we have a different approach, but both approaches are okay and um, occur in different areas. So this is a very common situation for wildlife management across North America. Animals go over political boundaries and they're subjected to different management regimes. And that, that's the way it is and that's okay for wolves too. Yes, um, wolves that live primarily in Yellowstone have been killed outside the park. Um, this probably has not affected the population much numerically. One year we lost 12% of our population in 2012. Uh, this year we lost only four wolves. Last year we lost none. So the number of wolves taken is highly variable and generally below 3%, uh, except that year 2012 where it reached 12% and it probably didn't even at that level affect our population numerically. But what's important, and the reason my answer to that question was yes, is the Park Service mission is to manage for a natural population. Wolves are very social animals, so they have a, a social network uh, that's important to how they function as a pack or a family. And we don't have as much information on that social functioning as we do about their population numbers. And we know that there is a harvestable surplus in terms of numbers. And that has not been exceeded so far for Yellowstone. But there are some questions if you remove a key wolf in the pack, uh, a high ranking individual, so to speak. Um, what's the impact on that pack? Uh, on that pack? Or a, a, a second ranking individual. What does that do to pack dynamics? In one case, it caused the pack to split apart. Was that because that high-ranking individual was removed, or would that pack have split up naturally? Um, those are important questions for the Park Service to wrestle with, because even though that doesn't affect the numbers of wolves, it affects how wolves live on the landscape and function to themselves. And places like Yellowstone hold this uh, dearly, because most wolves across North America are impacted by people. And most biologists would argue 
at a sustainable level. We still have lots of wolves across North America, but we really don't know certain aspects about wolf life. And this social aspect is the one we know the least about. So if we're going to be managers of Yellowstone that pursue these ideals of naturalness, I think it's important to include all aspects. And so uh, which wolves get removed and how that impacts the pack and the population, and importantly, the pack's relationship to each other, because they're always competing against each other. And if one pack loses some key individuals, we know that the individual makeup of packs affects how they compete with each other. Um, it also affects how they prey on elk. We know big males are important to helping take down elk. So those are questions we're wrestling with. So to say removing wolf has no impact on the wolf population, you have to qualify what you mean. Are you talking numeric or are you talking social? And we're still looking for those issues, for those answers. Wolves are one of the most studied species in the world. Uh, beginning in the late 1950s, they weren't. And because of the problems that are associated living with wolves, um, a lot of studies were kicked off in the, in the 50s and 60s. And now they're one of the most studied animals on the planet. And so it's hard to advance your knowledge in that kind of arena. But Yellowstone has. Uh, there was a book published in 2003, which was a review of all the science done on wolves up to that point. And in the introduction of that book, uh, the author said, we've tried to include of what, as, as much knowledge as Yellowstone has learned in the first few years, but Yellowstone holds the most promise to unlocking some of the wolves' secrets that are so far unknown. And I think Yellowstone has done that. And that's because, uh, and this is somewhat controversial, we've had a good radio collaring record, so we're able to follow individuals and packs um, the park is big, but it's more accessible than, say, northern Canada or Alaska. And about half our population is viewed daily from the road. And this is an odd feature of recovery that I didn't think would occur. I thought wolves would be more secretive and shy. But we're getting information about pack dynamics, about individuals, about predation, about interactions with other species on a daily basis. And there's no other study in the world that's doing that. And then we do the traditional things, radio tracking, airplanes, genetics, drawing blood, looking at disease exposure that all the other studies do. So you combine the traditional scientific methods with citizen science and daily observation and, and a public that loves to come here and see wild nature. And again, I can't overemphasize how important wolf recovery has been just to public enjoyment. Yellowstone is the best place in the world to view wolves and people come here to do it. And that's immeasurably important to the park's uh, goals and policies that, that people see intact nature. So yeah, Yellowstone has changed the world's view of, of wolves. And we're in the news all the time. And I think having positive news out there about wolves, because to be honest, there is a lot of negative because they're hard to live with. But having Yellowstone there providing this positive good news has been very important, not only for Yellowstone, but what we know about wolves and the image of wolves worldwide.